water. It's a lifeblood of the Ozarks. Clear, gurgling springs, tumbling streams, and majestic bluff-lined rivers. It keeps this lush, densely green and unspoiled region alive with wildlife. Two free-flowing rivers, the Current and Jack's Fork, are preserved within the Ozark National Scenic Riverways, a national park which attracts thousands to South Central Missouri each year. But this area's biggest asset, the clear, abundant water, is a bit mysterious and often misunderstood. What is the source of the cold, crystalline springs? Why are so many caves and sinkholes nearby? The answers lie deep underground, and they revolve around one word, karst. Karst refers to a limestone or dolomite region characterized by caves, springs, losing streams, and sinkholes. Often these parts are interconnected, creating a classic karst system. The Ozarks is full of karst landscapes. Why? The geology here offers a perfect setup for the formation of caves and springs. Eons ago, the area was covered with a warm, shallow sea teeming with life. As sea creatures died, their shells settled to the bottom, forming calcium-rich sediments that solidified into limestone, which then was infused with magnesium, turning much of the limestone into dolomite. Later, magma from deep in the Earth's crust lifted this prehistoric seabed, creating the Ozark Dome. Over time, rainwater falling on the Ozark Dome gradually dissolved bits of this layered rock, carving many streams and rivers. Rainwater flowed downhill, away from the dome's high spots, causing the area's rivers to radiate away from its center. The center line marks a major division between the Missouri River and the White River, both of which have huge watersheds. All rainwater that hits the ground has to drain somewhere. A watershed is an area of land in which all surface water drains into a common waterway. Watersheds interconnect. Smaller watersheds, like those shown here in South Central Missouri, drain into larger watersheds. Rainwater didn't just erode the land's surface to make rivers. Underground, the ancient layered dolomite rock was also dissolved. Little holes formed, which grew as the water trickled through and created networks of pipe-like channels. Some became tunnels which turned into caves. The Ozarks has one of the heaviest concentration of caves in the U.S. In karst areas, many creek bottoms do not have a solid bedrock base and are instead underlaid with fractured rock laced with channels that run into the subsurface water system. These creeks won't hold water. They're dry, except during heavy rainy spells and are called losing streams. South Central Missouri is full of losing streams, like the ones shown in brown on this map of the 11 Point River watershed. Rainwater continues to dissolve this rock, making underground holes bigger, and sometimes the ground above gives way, causing a sinkhole. Sinkholes come in all shapes and sizes. Some are like bowls, Others are deep and funnel-shaped. And some are gentle depressions. Many will hold water after a big rain. A few become permanent ponds. Sunken areas can be huge, covering many acres. These are called sink basins. As gravity carries groundwater downhill through these water-carved pipes and tunnels, Sometimes, the watercourse intersects with an opening in a hillside. Then the flow emerges onto the surface and becomes a spring. One of the biggest single outlet springs in the U.S. is right in the heart of the Ozarks. Big Spring doubles the volume of the current river. 
Second largest in the area is Greer Spring on the Eleven Point River. And third is Mammoth Spring, source of Arkansas's Spring River. About six miles northwest of Mammoth Spring is Grand Gulf, a magnificent mile-long sinkhole which formed when a cave roof collapsed. Now a state park, it features deep, steep passages, a natural bridge, and a large cave that used to lead to an underground river before the cave was sealed up with mud from storms during the 1920s. I graduated from West Plains High School in 1968. As I was growing up, the old timers in this area told me many stories about Grand Gulf and how they used to go back to a running river or lake of water in it, throw things like bales of hay in, and they would come up at Mammoth Springs. As I prepared to do my senior science fair project, I contacted geologists in Rolla, Missouri, and asked them how I might seek to prove that that was true. They told me I could put fluorescein dye in the mouth of the cave when water was running into it to see if the dye did come from Grand Gulf to Mammoth Springs. I waited for a large rain. I went down to Grand Gulf one night in the dark, put the fluorescein dye in, then drove about six miles to Mammoth Springs, put the charcoal filters in where the water runs over the dam there. We found that it took about two and a half to three days and the dye did in fact appear in Mammoth Springs. I won a, a chance to go to a national symposium with NASA and I presented my results there. Tony A. didn't just win a science award, he made history. By conducting one of the Ozarks first dye traces, he proved that an underground river connects Grand Gulf and Mammoth Spring. Grand Gulf is the ending point for an enormous sink basin that extends for thousands of acres. That sink basin even has a developed surface stream within it. But that stream goes underground at Grand Gulf, which can be full to the brim during heavy rainy spells. Only a few years after Tony Aid did his high school dye trace, the U.S. Forest Service hired Tom Ailey to conduct dye traces. Our longest distance trace was 39 and a half miles with the dye coming out at Big Spring on the Current River, going in the ground in the 11 Point River Basin. That trace, first done by Ailey in 1972, is one of the longest distance dye traces known. This is one of our dye samplers. This is a charcoal packet. It's placed to adsorb the tracer dye. We have left this packet in here since before we introduced the dye. Then we'll take it to the lab and do an analysis. So basically the way these traces are done, uh, you put the dye in, you sample many springs throughout an area, you find out where it doesn't go and where it does go. What we are doing is delineating the area that contributes water to a particular spring. And that contributing area is called the recharge area. In this way, hydrologists have mapped recharge areas for Big Spring, Mammoth Spring, Greer Spring, and others 